I'm really glad that you are here tonight, and I look forward to our study time together. We have several who are new and some who weren't able to be back tonight, but I'm glad that you are here. Let me draw your attention to the handouts on the table. There's only four per table, so if you need one, just go to another table and pick it up, and uh, you can have uh, one of those or how many you need. Uh, but you'll want to have a, a, a handout for tonight. It looks identical to the handout from last week, but it is different. Okay, so you'll need to have a new handout tonight. I do have some handouts from last time, two weeks ago, and if you didn't get one, you're welcome to them. If I don't have enough, if you'll just give me your, uh, just let me know, we'll get one to you pronto. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I want to um, let you know that what we've done on the handout is intentionally to put it with three holes in case you want to take the staple out and put it in a three-ring binder if that works better for you, then it's available to you either way, however you want to do it. And uh, we want to remind you that tomorrow night at 6 o'clock in the auditorium we'll have our prayer meeting. Our nation and our church needs prayer more now than ever. And I am so uh, burdened for what we need from the Lord, and so I just challenge every one of us to be praying and to attend the prayer meeting if you can. Let's start with the word of prayer ourselves. <clears throat> Holy Father, we are so grateful to you tonight for your goodness to us. We're grateful because you provide for us a church, a church family, a time that we can be together and study about who you are, study about your word, but more than just about it, to internalize your word and to draw closer to you through it. And Lord, I pray that this night would be a night of doing so. I pray that we would, as a church body, that we would grow together and that we would serve you with our whole heart as one body and as individuals as well. I pray, Lord, that you would renew our faith tonight and our strengthen us in our walk with you. I pray that you'd bless our pastor while he's on vacation. And I pray that you would meet all of our needs tonight. We pray in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Now, the, uh, if you're watching by video, because we're going to have some people watching this video later, and if you need a handout, all you have to do is uh, text or email me and or call the church office, and we'll be sure and get you one, because it is going to be a lot easier to follow along with the handout. Now, let me sort of go over the design of the study. <clears throat> of course, I prayed... A long time about even what topic we were going to study and finally came to believe that this study on typology was what the Lord wanted me to to lead during this time it may seem like an unusual topic to you but uh, it's a topic that I think uh, has been talked about but it's not really usually taught in any fullness and certainly in four weeks we can't do it in a, a great full way but at least we're going to get some highlights uh, to you about typology. So last week we did quite a bit uh, on introductory material, just in introducing the concept of what a type is and talking about where it is in the Bible and what uh, the Bible has to say about types. We went in pretty in-depth with uh, the words that are used in Scripture, or at least the word, one word for type that's used. There are other words that are used in, in Scripture besides the word type. Uh, that word type we talked about last time was is sometimes translated other words like pattern or example and so forth. But there are other words like the word copy, the English word copy, the English word shadow. Those words are important in typology. Um, and, and there are other words beyond that as well. But anyway, we'd spend a lot of time talking about that. We're going to do just a little bit more introduction uh, by way of introduction tonight, just to set our feet on what we're going to actually study. But then, last week, we introduced the first and most important named type in the Scripture. Anybody remember who that was? Adam. Adam. Adam is a type of Christ. Adam is a type of Christ, and we'll be talking more about that in the future weeks. Now, the next study, two weeks from tonight, I'm not going to give you any details, but it may be end up being the most interesting study to you of all of the four that we have. 
I think you'll find it uh, helpful <clears throat> and interesting. Uh, the last session, we're going to cover more actual types than we'll cover in any other session. So we're going to go through a whole bunch of, uh, of the types that are in Scripture so that you can see that there are many <clears throat> in Scripture. Now, the, uh, last week I also mentioned some resources. I talked to you in a little bit of depth about Strong's Concordance and about Thayer's Greek Lexicon. But those are, Strong's is a tool that I would encourage every believer to have. Um, if you don't need Strong's because it's King James Version, uh, I, I find it very helpful even at that. But if you don't need it, there are plenty of other concordances that will help you. But most of us today depend on online resources rather than an actual book like Strong's or Thayer's or Young's or something like that. And so I wanted to mention to you some online resources that I find very helpful. Most of you are probably already familiar with BibleGateway.com, uh, I think. Uh, and Bible Gateway has a lot of good resources, but it's particularly good at being able to compare uh, different translations of the Bible and to look up quickly. The ESV Bible has an, an app that you can download. I'm sure many other translations do. That's the one that I use on my phone uh, is the ESV app. I also have on my phone, but you have to purchase this, the ESV Study Bible, and that's a helpful tool. I'd find it not always accurate in my mind, but often it's very helpful. The, uh, there's also some Greek and Hebrew tools along with the ESV that I have on my phone that uh, used to not cost very much. I haven't looked to see what they cost now, uh, but they, they, they can help if you're going to go into in-depth study. But the one resource that I use more than any other as far as an online resource is blueletterbible.org, blueletterbible.org. Now, Blue Letter Bible has uh, several tabs on it. One is so that you can actually see the Greek equivalent of each word in a verse. Another so that you can see, and it's all on one page, I love this, all of the different translations uh, of a single verse all together. Another one is, um, another tab has um, cross-referencing. Then there's commentaries. So there's quite a few different resources on uh, Blue Letter Bible. If you look at the Greek t helps uh, in Blue Letter Bible, it'll take you to a wealth of other resources. In fact, that's where I copied the Thayers from last week was from Blue Letter Bible, the, uh, rather than using an actual book. There's also even hymns connected with that particular verse on Blue Letter Bible. So I find it to be a very uh, good resource. It also has a lot of articles on it. Um, now, I want to draw your attention to the first page after the cover page in your handout because, and I would encourage you uh, as we do this tonight to don't, don't read ahead on the handout because that sort of defeats the purpose of the handout. The handout has two major purposes. One is to help guide us through the study, um, and another purpose is so that when you get home you can look at more detail about it. But if you'll follow along in the... Uh, in the um, handout and go with us as we go, I think it'll make it more he very helpful to you and more interesting. So what I want to talk about first is how the types reveal great doctrinal truths. Doctrinal truths. I've listed three of them here. We could list others. But the first one is that all Scripture is about Christ. Now, we know that, but we need to really consider that typology is one of the major ways that we can say that all Scripture is about Christ. So here's a couple of verses here. Luke 24, 27 is our theme verse for this study. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. There's another one that Jesus said in John 5, verse 39 and 40. You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. But then notice the warning that Jesus gives in the end of this sentence. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So just because the scriptures reveal Christ doesn't mean that everybody is going to uh, accept what the scripture has to say. 
The second great doctrinal truth is that God is sovereign over all of history. Now, the point that I want to make here is that typology proves this. Typology proves the sovereignty of God, just like prophecy does. Prophecy is amazing because it shows that there's one God superintending every event all the way through history. And so the prophecies that were fulfilled, and we gave you a list in last week's handout of the ones that were fulfilled in the first coming of Christ, 108 prophecies, and those prophecies that were fulfilled demonstrate the sovereignty of God all of, over all of history. But so does typology demonstrate that as well. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8 says. And so in the Old Testament, he's the same. In the New Testament, he's the same. And the pictures that we get through typology of Christ in the Old Testament are very plainly pictures that help us to see him in the New Testament. And then Revelation 1.8, one of my favorites, um, the Lord says, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So this is the sovereignty of God in all of history. Then the third doctrinal truth I want to mention is that the Bible is completely cohesive. It's a single unity rather than just a collection of books over a period of time. Now, the world looks at the Bible that way as a collection of 66 books that have been gathered together by various people for various reasons and uh, made into one book. But we know that that's not the truth. The truth is that it is a single book made up of 66 other books, and that God has, has inspired the writing of every one of those 66 books. Every single word in those 66 books was written by human authors, but it was ultimately authored by the Holy Spirit himself. And typology proves that. Typology, typology shows that all through the Bible, the whole plan was to be about Jesus and to show us the details about Christ, even in the Old Testament. So we can use this, the verse, all scripture is breathed out by God uh, in 2 Timothy 3 or in Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. It was fixed before it was ever written. It's always been God's word. It's always been there. It's just been come to us in a progressive way. Now, this unity is further revealed in these next two verses on this page, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1.20. I love this verse. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. All the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. And then Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, where it says, making known to us the mystery of his will. Will, typology, is a mystery in the Old Testament. It's not revealed. If you just had the Old Testament, you would never see it. You would not be able to see any of these types in the Old Testament if we did not have the New Testament. It's only in the New Testament that the types are revealed. And so making known, to, and that's not what this verse is talking about. It's not just talking about typology, but it's, typology is part of it making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, everything in the world, everything that's created, and God's word itself, which is not created, is um, together unity in Christ. So that's a beautiful verse. Go to the next page, the back of that page, actually. When we talk about types, there's something that you ought to note. Now, this is only true in a few cases, but it's worthy of mention. And that is the comparative words, as and so, as and so. The word as in these verses is used for the type. And the word so is used for the anti-type. Now, we talked about what anti-type means next, last time. Anti-type is not against the type. It's the fulfillment of the type. 
It's when the type comes to fruition. And it explains that here uh, in this sentence. I think this is good. The first, the type, is historic. The second, the antitype, is prophetic. In other words, the type is a historic event, person, place, or thing that prophesies to the anti-type in the New Testament. And some people even call types prophecies. I believe it's a separate study, so that's why we've separated them. So here's three examples. I don't want to just read them and leave them alone, though. I want us to think about them for a minute. The first one was, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. What does it mean, as and so? As were the days of Noah. How is the days of Noah a type of the coming of the Son of Man? Judgment. judgment. And not just judgment, but unexpected judgment. Noah expected the judgment. We expect judgment. But the world did not expect judgment. Even with the preaching of Noah or the preaching of us, the world has no clue that judgment is suddenly going to come upon them. This is talked about all throughout Scripture. The sudden unexpected judgment that comes, just like in the days of Noah. As were in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Anytime you find the phrase Son of Man in Scripture, uh, if it's talking about Christ, it's going to have one of two meanings. Jesus used it about himself just to refer to him as being human. But if it's in a, a bigger context where it's quoted as you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory or the Son of Man in this verse, Matthew twenty four thirty seven, it's always talking about the coming judge at the end of the age. Jesus is the Son of Man in that sense, that he is the coming judge at the end of the age. Now, the next one here, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So what's the parallel between the serpent in the wilderness and Jesus? Salvation. Salvation. Great. Any other thoughts? When they lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, it was because of the death that was in the camp from the snakes that were biting them. And that serpent, all they had to do was look at the serpent and they would be delivered from the death that was there. What a beautiful picture of Christ. Christ became our sin on the cross. He became, just like that serpent was a brass serpent representing the serpents, Christ became, he wasn't representing, he actually became our sin. Remember we talked about the exaltation of the anti-type, that it's, it's greater than the type. And so Christ actually became our sin on the cross and became our substitute. And all we must do is to look to him in faith and we will live. So it's a beautiful type. The next one, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. How is that a type of Christ? Well, it's obvious it's the resurrection, the burial, and the resurrection, but think about it a little further. Uh, Jonah thought that was the end. He thought he was dying. He thought he was dead. He was uh, in that fish, and from the words that the book of Jonah tells us, we know that Jonah expected at any moment for his life to, to perish. But in reality, that trip into the belly of the fish was a turning point, not only in Jonah's life, but in the life of all those who heard his preaching. It was a great turning point. Well, the same thing is due of, uh, true of Christ, who was buried and then raised from the dead. It, uh, to the disciples, it seemed like the end. It seemed like it was all over with. But it was a great turning point, not just for them, but for the whole history of the world, turns on that one single event in, in history. 
And so just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. These are types. These are types that are explained in the New Testament. So that leads us to the next page. Now, I really don't want you to jump ahead here because I want to take you through this in a really particular way. We're going to only look at the numbered items first. We're not going to look at the examples under each. But there's four uh, statements here that are very important. Number one says, examples of types that are plainly revealed as types in the New Testament. So some types, we already talked about Adam, is plainly revealed as a type in the New Testament. Number two, examples of types that are revealed in the New Testament but are not specifically labeled as types. Some things are types, but they're not necessarily labeled to be types in the New Testament. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say, this is a type. Okay. Um, number three, examples of types that are not revealed in the New Testament, but are too obvious not to be considered. There are some, and we're going to look, that's going to be our actual topic tonight. And then number four, examples of types possibly taken too far. Now, I actually took these two examples from Christian writings. These writings are from the um, 1700s. Uh, one uh, famous theologian believed that spider webs are a type of material possessions. And the verse he got that from is Job 8.14. His confidence is severed and his trust is a spider's web. Now, I could imagine that being a metaphor... Uh, but I don't think I would call it a type. This particular person probably thought metaphors and types were the same thing, and maybe they are. But to me, that's not a type. Uh, that's something, uh, just a good teaching from the verse, perhaps. Perhaps, I'm not sure about that even. Um, then the next one maybe is a little easier to see. Lions are a type of Satan. Remember the New Testament verse, 1 Peter 5, 8, Satan roams as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The verse that this writer was using is Judges 14, 5. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came toward him roaring. Well, there's some problems with my mind with that being a type. Because in the first place, Samson killed that lion, and I don't think we're going to kill Satan. Okay, now there, all types are not completely parallel, but that one sort of falls apart there. Another problem I have with that is Revelation 5.5 5 calls Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. So I'd hate to just say that lions in the Old Testament are a type of uh, Satan. I don't think that's actually true. So those are types that somebody has preached on, written in their commentary or whatever, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with. Some people might, and that's fine. Uh, that, you know, they, may, they may see it different or better than I do, but I don't see it that way. Let's jump back to the first example, examples of types that are plainly revealed as types in the New Testament. So we have Adam that we've already talked about, and we base that on Romans 5.14 because if you'll notice the word type there is in italics in that verse because that is the actual word type, translated type, in uh, that verse. So that's the main type that lets us even know that types exist. And then the rock. This is taken from 1 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. I mean, it explains it right there, that the rock in the wilderness that they drank from was Christ himself. So it's very explanatory. And it even goes ahead in verse 6 to say, now these things took place as examples. That's the same Greek word, we talked about this two weeks ago, as the word type. It's the same word, just translated here, examples instead of type. So that we might not desire evil as they did. So these are types that are mentioned in the New Testament and explained in the New Testament. Then you have the types that are revealed in the New Testament, but they're not, the no word does it use the word types or example or anything, uh, even copy or shadow, to help us see them as types. And it says at the end of that verse, uh, talking about Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the writer of Hebrews takes great pains in three different chapters, I believe, 
to explain this. Uh, Melchizedek is just barely mentioned. He's important, but he's just barely mentioned in Genesis 14. But then he's mentioned again in one of the most famous psalms, Psalm 110. And so he's a pretty significant character, especially when you get to reading about him in Hebrews. It helps us to understand that he is a type of Christ. Some people have said that Melchizedek is a theophany of Christ, but I disagree. Uh, he is a type of Christ. And then um, number theophany is an Old Testament uh, appearance of Christ. Then uh, letter B, the serpent. We already talked about this one just a while ago. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. So it's, it's uh, an example of a type that's revealed in the New Testament, but it's not labeled as a type, but it ob obviously is. Now we're going to come to the topic we're going to study tonight, and that is examples of types that are not revealed in the New Testament, but are too obvious to be considered. Two weeks ago, I mentioned briefly this one about Abraham, but here I'm talking more specifically about Abraham being willing to sacrifice Isaac. And then the example that we have in the, New T in the Old Testament of Joseph. Neither of these are mentioned as uh, types or even looked at as types in the New Testament as far as I'm aware. I've not heard any teaching. Uh, Abraham sacrificing Isaac is mentioned in Hebrews 11, but it doesn't really, if you read that, you don't really get the sense that he's trying to say this was a picture of Christ, though it obviously is. But let's go to Genesis in our handout. We won't, have, we won't take time to read it in uh, the Bible, uh, though, though that's very important. And I don't ever want to omit the Scripture. That's why I've been reading Scriptures along. But we don't have time to read every one of these Scriptures. We're going to allude to them and talk about them some. But it would be worth your time to take these passages and actually study them. Like I've said last time, some will be more obvious than others, but it'll bless you to study these scriptures along with this handout and see this. Now, the first thing, we're talking here about Genesis chapter 22. That is the encounter where God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, and Abraham takes Isaac to the mountain to sacrifice him, and God, uh, just as Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, God provides a substitute of a ram uh, caught in the thicket for Abraham to sacrifice. Genesis 24, the other passage we're going to be talking about here, is where Abraham sends his servant, Eliezer, uh, to go to get a wife for Isaac. And he goes to uh, the land where his ancestors lived, and he encounters Rebekah, and he brings Rebekah back to the uh, to be Isaac's wife, and while the servant is there, he gives gifts to Rebecca. So we have here two in two events in Scripture that we're sort of going to merge here to see the whole typology that I think is relevant. Now it says here the first statement is Abraham is a type of God. Now get your terminology here correct, okay? Abraham is not a type of God, okay? He is a type of God. You hear what I'm saying? Okay. He, this, this is a picture. This is a picture of what God is like in Abraham. It's not that he's acting like God here. It's just that this is a, a portrait of God in Abraham. And so just briefly, Abraham sent his servant to bring a bride for his son Isaac, just like God the Father sent the Holy Spirit to bring a bride, the church, for his son, Jesus. And I've listed some passages there that would help you to understand this. If you balk at the concept of the Father sending the Holy Spirit like Abraham sent the servant, I've listed several verses there that talk about God the Father sending the Holy Spirit. That is a part of the uh, operation in the Trinity. You're going to see another one here in a minute that might strike you a little bit funny or odd. And then letter C, Abraham loved his son. God the Father loves his son. I preached about this back the Sunday before Easter, how the very first mention of love in the Bible is when God tells Abraham, take your son whom you love. So the very first mention of love in the Bible is the love of a father 
for his son. That's not the type of love we tend to think about. We think about motherly love. We think about the love between a man and a woman or something like that. But the very first mention of love in the scripture is the love of a father for his son because it's a picture of God loving Christ. And the very first mention of love in the New Testament is God's love for Jesus. It's in Matthew 3. It says, and this is my, at the baptism, this is my son, my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. And then I mentioned uh, that the first mention in Mark is the same passage. This is my beloved son. Same in Luke. This is my beloved son. First mention of love in John is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. So God's love is pictured from Abraham all the way through to Christ, all the way through to his love for us. That's a beautiful picture of Christ, and that's why we can say with quite a bit of assurance that Abraham is uh, typifying God here in this event. Number two, Isaac is typical or typifying Christ, is a type of Christ, and there's a bunch here. Both Isaac and Christ were children of promise. Now, if you don't know these events, you need to go back and read these chapters because it'll, it'll stand out to you. But they're both children of promise. They both, uh, their birth was pre-announced. And we have other births in the Old Testament uh, and the New that were pre-announced, and they may well be types of Christ also. But this one is so... Uh, so many things here are parallel, it's obvious. And then both Isaac and Christ were named before they were born. That wasn't too terribly uncommon, but it was not the norm. And, but they were both named before they were born. The birth of both was contrary to nature. A, Sarah was barren, a very old barren woman in her 90s. And uh, Barry was a virgin. Both are called an only son, even though technically uh, Isaac had a half-brother named Ishmael. He's called the only son um, of Abraham, and Jesus, of course, is the only son. In, and then uh, they both were mocked and persecuted by their own kindred. Neither Isaac nor Christ had broken the law that they should be offered up. Now, this doesn't mean that Isaac had not broken the law. It means that when he was taken uh, by Abraham to be offered up, he wasn't being sacrificed because of something evil he had done. He was not being sacrificed because he had broken any law. He was being sacrificed because Abraham was obeying God. So both were, neither Christ nor Isaac had broken any law that they should be offered up. As Isaac carried the wood on which he was to die, Christ carried his own cross. As Isaac went willingly to the altar, so Christ went willingly to the cross. Both apparently had been given up or forsaken by his father. Both rose from the place of death in resurrection. This is where Hebrews 11 comes in. It's not listed here, but in Hebrews 11, it actually says that Isaac was raised from the dead, figuratively speaking, when this happened. And then, I forgot to put the, somehow I missed the verses that should be on letter L, so if you want to drop those down, uh, you can. In both cases, God interposed. Genesis 22, 13, that's where God substituted the ram for Isaac so that Abraham did not kill his son. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 21, which says that Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So God interposed, substituting Christ for us. Now on the back of that page, we have Eliezer, the servant, who is typifying the Holy Spirit. Now this first statement sounds a little weird, but we're going to give you the... I, I thought about changing the wording, uh, but I, I didn't, just so I could explain it, I guess. As Eliezer was a servant of Abraham, so the Holy Spirit is a servant of God. Notes that's in quotes. In what way is the Holy Spirit a servant of God? That sounds weird because the Holy Spirit is God. But we do know that in the Trinity, there are certain functions that each 
person in the Trinity fulfills. And the Father sends the Holy Spirit, just like Abraham sent Eliezer. And we have, I gave you multiple references earlier that I've mentioned to you about how this is true. So in that sense, we're talking about uh, the Holy Spirit could be represented as a servant just like Eliezer was. Letter B, Eliezer's mission was to go to Haran and get a bride for Isaac. So the Holy Spirit has been sent from heaven to get a bride for Christ. The Old Testament teaches us that God the Father made covenant with God the Son. He was going to bring a bride to the Son. It's not spelled out real clearly, but it's much more clear in the New Testament. And the Holy Spirit is the agent who accomplishes that. And that's... Uh, uh, John 16, 7 through 11. That's a beautiful passage where Jesus says, if I don't go away, uh, it's better for you if I go away because then the Holy Spirit will come, the helper will come. And then he says, um, he says that the, um, if, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And he explains all of that in great detail there. So this is part of the role of the Holy Spirit. Not the only role of the Holy Spirit, but it's part of his role. Letter C, as Eliezer was not sent to get a bride for Isaac until after he was typically, meaning as a type, offered up. So the Holy Spirit was not, yet, not sent to get a bride for Christ until after his death and resurrection. So in other words, Genesis 22 happens before Genesis 24 get the idea that 22 where Isaac is the type of Christ being sacrificed happens first and then the servant is sent to get the bride and in the New Testament Jesus is offered as a sacrifice first and then the Holy Spirit goes to get uh, the bride for Christ and then letter E as Eliezer was urgent so the Holy Spirit is urgent if you haven't read that passage in a while Eliezer presses upon Rebecca and her family to, for her to go back and, in, and almost insists and gives reasons why she is the one that God has ordained to be the wife of Isaac. And so the Holy Spirit is urgent with us. Now is the time of salvation. Today is the day. As, Eli, as Eliezer, by the precious gifts he gave, Rebecca revealed the wealth of his master Isaac, so the Holy Spirit, by his gifts, gives us a foretaste of what is in store for the bride of Christ, the church. Uh, you could even liken this to spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. Then Rebecca, typifying the bride of Christ, the church. As Rebecca believed and yielded to the words of Eliezer, so the church believes and yields to the words of of the Holy Spirit. As Rebecca was willing to separate herself from her kinsfolk for Isaac's sake, so the believer is willing to separate himself from his kinsfolk for Jesus' sake. And as Eliezer on the way to Isaac told Rebecca all about his master Isaac and what was in store for her, so the Holy Spirit tells us not of himself, but of Christ. So it's a great picture in that regard. Now, just for interest's sake, have any of you uh, studied this in this much depth before? Looked at this particular type in this much depth before? I find usually that most people understand Genesis 22 as being a type, but they've never really thought about Genesis 24 in a full explanation of this kind of a type. Some people do take exception to what I'm teaching tonight. Not for any real big reason, but I mean this, don't see it quite the way that I see it. But I've tried to explain it to you the best I know how so that you can see what I'm, where I'm coming from and why I believe it clearly is a picture of Christ in the Old Testament. Comments or questions about that before we move on? I want somebody who's bold enough to read loud. Um, read. Um, uh, at the top of the page it says, number one, type. Number one, type. Now this is from the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis, chapters 37 through 50. Okay, somebody read number one type. Okay, they conspired to kill him. All right, now somebody has number one anti-type. 
Okay, from the day that in the New Testament, book of John, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, the leaders of the Jewish nation uh, made plans to put him to death. They conspired to kill him. All right, uh, number two type. They stripped his robe. I have to move out of the way of camera here. <laughs> All right, somebody read uh, uh, two anti-type. So they stripped him of his robe. All right, his robes. All right, number three type. They sold him as a slave. All right, number three anti-type. They sold him as a slave. All right, now number four type. They took him to Egypt. All right, and number four anti-type. Okay, they took him to Egypt. Now you see how this works? These are parallels. There are tw at least 24 parallels between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus. Now, I, that's uncanny. I mean, that's just amazing. It's, it's just mind-boggling to think about the parallels. This could not, if you take anybody else's life and try to parallel it this way, it's not going to work, especially when you're talking about these kind of extreme things. Um, conspired to kill him, stripped him of his robe, sold him as a slave, and took him to Egypt. That's pretty significant. And so this, we're going to look at this uh, tonight. Now, I hope, once again, that you're familiar with the passage in Genesis. It's wonderful to read. It's my second favorite story in all the Bible, um, just to read it. My favorite is the crucifixion of Christ. I love to read the crucifixion. It ministers to me when I read it every time and helps me to think about things I've never thought about before. But if I read Genesis 47 through 50, to me, it's the most fascinating, the most beautiful uh, story in, or event in all of Scripture besides the crucifixion. My third favorite is this, the book of Esther. Okay, so maybe you have your favorites too, but I have those favorites. I've got other favorites too, but those are my top. Now, um, now, when we do this, I want you to see that pattern we talked about of type and anti-type and how that the anti-type is always exalted higher than the type. It's bigger. It's grander. It's more fulfilled. It's more unbelievable. It's more beyond our reckoning. And so this is a beautiful thing. So the first type here is Joseph was a shepherd of his father's sheep. Well, so what? A lot of people were shepherds of their father's sheep. But it's very clear in the Old Testament that Joseph was, and Jesus very plainly says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And so, and I hope you're familiar with these verses in the New Testament. I'm just going to allude to them. Uh, if, you, if you can't look at these verses and say, oh, what, what that verse says, you need some more Bible study, okay? It's not that that's important necessarily to always know the address, the scripture reference, but these are pretty po powerful verses, and you probably ought to know these references just by sight to know what they are about. Now, that sounds belittling. I don't mean it that way. I just mean you ought to strive toward that, all right? Um, second, Joseph was beloved of his father, uh, even to the point of being uh, Jacob's favorite child. But the scripture says that Jesus, and this is the same verse, Matthew three seventeen, that I referenced a moment ago, that at the baptism, God said, this is my son whom I love. So Joseph was beloved his father. Third, Joseph was hated by his brothers. He was hated by his brothers. Um, Jesus was hated by his brethren, we would say, by his kinfolk, by his nation, and that's in John 7, 4, and 5, and in other passages as well. Joseph was sent by his father to his brethren. He was sent to go and check on his brothers. And in Hebrews 2.11, it talks about Jesus calling us his brothers. In um, it, Joseph's brothers plotted to harm him. We just read this in this activity, that the Jews plotted to kill 
Jesus. Um, they took his robes from uh, Joseph. And we read that also. They took Jesus' garments from him. Joseph was sold by his brothers for the price of a slave. And so this also, Jesus was sold for the price of a slave. 20 shekels of silver in the Old Testament, 30 in the New. Um, they both had their robe dipped in blood. Remember Joseph when his brothers took the robe, the robe of many colors, and they wanted to prove to Jacob that, that Joseph had died by a wild beast. They dipped it in blood and took it back to uh, Jacob. But Revelation 19 says that Jesus, when he returns, his robe will be dipped in blood. And then uh, he was taken to Egypt. And we already read how Jesus also was taken to Egypt. Joseph was tempted, you remember, by Potiphar's wife. Jesus, in Matthew 4, 1, was tempted by Satan. Genesis 39, Joseph was unjustly accused and condemned even though he was innocent. And, of course, this is true of Jesus as well. Joseph was totally innocent with Potiphar's wife. He stood as a man of character in that incident. Uh, and yet he was unjustly accused and condemned even though he was innocent. Now, actually, you could add this as another uh, a 25th feature of a type here. Did you know that nowhere in the uh, Bible does it ever condemn Joseph for any action? There's nowhere that Joseph is ever condemned for any of his actions. Now, we condemn him a little bit for telling his dreams, but we sort of say more that he was just not very smart than that he was evil. Uh, he could have been totally innocent in that. I believe he was. Uh, but, you know, his brothers didn't like it, and his, even his dad reprimanded him for it. But we don't have any indication that Joseph was, had evil intent in telling his dreams. And, of course, there's nothing recorded about Jesus as being uh, guilty of any sin either. That does not mean Joseph was guiltless. He wasn't. He was human. He sinned. But the Bible just doesn't record that he did, just like it doesn't record that Jesus did, because Jesus actually didn't. So that's another parallel. Uh, these are all parallels, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about types. They were both bound in chains. Um, they both were placed with two other prisoners. And this you could separate into two different things here, because both of them were placed with two prisoners. Brother Kent preached on this week before last, the Je or no, last week, Jesus hanging between the two robbers. Um, but as we learn from Luke, one of those men was saved and one was lost. Same thing with Joseph. One of the people in prison with him was saved. The other one was uh, executed. The, uh, Joseph asked to be remembered due to his innocence. There, when he was in jail, he asked, please remember me when you're out of this place. Jesus commands us to remember him in the Lord's Supper. The Pharaoh acknowledged the Spirit of God in Joseph. Luke 4.1 says that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit when he began his ministry. Um, both were exalted after their suffering. Joseph became second in command over all of Egypt. And Jesus, of course, is exalted sitting at the right hand of the Father. They both were 30 years old at the beginning of their public recognition. This is mentioned in each case about Joseph and about Jesus. Uh, the Bible records that both of them wept. Joseph wept when his brothers came uh, into the room and he recognized who they were. And uh, Jesus wept at Lazarus' uh, graveside. They both forgave those who wronged them. Joseph forgave his brothers. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They both, were, they both saved their nation. Uh, Genesis 50-20, I call it the Old Testament, Romans 8-28. Um, you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The saving of many lives. Just the whole nation of uh, Jacob and his descendants were saved because of God's work in Joseph's life. And all of us the whole nation of Israel and all of uh, the uh, spiritual descendants of um, Israel are saved as a result of Jesus. 
What men did to hurt them, God turned to good. And there's that Genesis 50, 20 verse. Both dispensed bread to the world. That's what Joseph became famous for, was giving people bread during the famine. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Uh, Everybody bowed to Joseph when he was there in Egypt. And Philippians 2 says that every knee will bow to Christ. And then the best land was prepared for Joseph's brothers to dwell in, the land of Goshen. Pharaoh said, here's the best land we have. You let your family live there. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. So the best land is being prepared for us. Now, this is not mentioned in the New Testament as a type. But do you think? (laughs) I mean, I think it's pretty conclusive. I don't think there's any doubt about it. I think you'd have to really try hard to deny that the sovereignty of God was at work in the recording of Joseph's life, not to see the portrait of Christ that is there. Are these 24 coincidences? I think not. I want you for just a moment to go back to the very first page after the cover sheet. These events in Genesis 22, 24, chapters 37 through 50, reveal great doctrinal truths. First, that all Scripture is about Jesus Christ. Second, that God is sovereign over all of history. And third, that the Bible is completely cohesive, a single unity rather than a collection of books over time. And the author of that work is the Holy Spirit. All right? That's all that I have. You have comments or questions? Be happy to take some.